Okay, let's pray. Uh, we will start. Father, we thank you for another day, another opportunity to get together and learn. And Father, we even as we uh, go through your word and study, we pray that each of us will be equipped to serve you well and to serve people well. We thank you, Father. We commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, okay, audio is not clear. Is it better now? Is the audio okay? Fine. Okay. okay. Um, we are um, studying the subject of suffering. And last week, we talked, uh, and we are looking at why there is suffering, uh, several different reasons. And we were looking at the first one, which is suffering due to the bondage of corruption. Okay, page 84, uh, page 85. So what we said was uh, from Romans 8, 17 to 20, that's the main passage that we looked at last week. And uh, Paul uh, clearly explains to us that all of creation was subject to this bondage of corruption. And all of creation. God gave it up. He let it go. Not willingly, and this was not his will, but he let it go because he had a hope. That means he had a future. That one day, all this will be restored, redeemed, and he is going to have new heavens and the new earth. So he knew the hope. That means he knew the future. So it's okay. But now... I'm letting it go, not willingly. So all of creation came in subjection to corruption. And because of that, we are seeing all kinds of things happening in this world. Right, right from things like, uh, you know, babies are born with problems. So I said, why baby never did anything wrong? Why is it having these problems? Okay, it's not baby's fault. It's not God's fault. The processes that God had put in place has become corrupted. It's gone away from its original design. So why is earthquake, or volcano, tsunami? Sometimes you say God is doing it. Hey, don't blame God. God is not doing it. When God created the world, he created it perfect. Everything was good. But because of sin, everything has become corrupted. And that's how all these things happen. But there is going to be new heavens and the new earth. But these kinds of problems will not be there. Sin and death and sickness will not be there. Right? So this helps us understand. You know? And then Paul describes over in 2 Corinthians 4. Uh, he says, you know, our outward man is perishing. This outward body. So, But remember, in the beginning, it was not like that. Adam, when God created Adam and Eve, their bodies were going to live forever and ever. But because of sin, they started dying slowly. You know, some those days they lived for 900 some years, 960 years, 950 years, almost one, almost 1,000 years. But they slowly came down. It came down. Now it's like 100, 80 to 100, 70, 80, 100. So bodies are dying. But one day, God will give us glorified bodies. Will not never die. So that because God knows what He has in the future, and now fine, is let it go. This way, right? So keep we we'll keep this in mind. That's the first reason, right? And we also said that when we as believers step into such situations, our goal must be. How can we bring this back to order? So the example we saw, we mentioned was in John 9, 
when Jesus and his disciples, they meet a blind man. So this man was born blind, which means we are saying something has caused this problem. Right? And we can understand, yeah, there's a bondage of corruption. But it's not his fault. Not his parents' fault. He's born this way. So disciples asking, you know, what caused it? You know, did he sin? Did his father and parents sin? So they're trying to give the reason for it. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. We are here to do the works of God. What is the work of God? It is to change this. To bring healing in this case, to bring healing to this blindness. So that is how we must approach these situations. Right? Yeah, we know it's not perfect, but let us bring our faith, uh, bring God's anointing, bring the word, whatever God is going to bring it to bear on the situation so that we can bring it to the way God designed it. That should be our. Okay? I'm not saying we'll put everything back. But we're saying case by case when we deal with Jesus didn't when Jesus came, he didn't say, All blind men, open your eyes. No, he healed some of the blind people who came to him in faith, listened to his teaching, and he prayed, ministered. Some blind people. There were many other blind people all around Israel who stayed blind. But the, the point is, we when we enter into these situations, we bring faith to bear, the word of God to bear, to bring healing, bring restoration. Right? Doesn't mean we'll save the whole world. That work only God will do in the end. Secondly, why is there suffering? Because of people's own action. Right? See, the Bible teaches us, Galatians 6, 7 and 8, it says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will also reap. He who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. He who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap life everlasting. So don't be deceived. You cannot fool God. What you sow, you will reap. And that 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 rule or that law applies to everybody, believer and non-believer. See, if you think about it in the natural. If a believer sows tomato seed, what will come? <laughs> if a non-believer throws tomato seed, what will come? Tomato only will come. Not hope. Oh, this is blessed tomato. This is not <laughs> nothing like that. It's the same. Right? So this law applies to everybody. What you sow, you will be. Right? So. There is some there is suffering due to some people own action. Suppose you think about somebody who's always smoking. They say it is very dangerous. Keep on smoking, affects lungs, lung cancer. Pastor said, God gave you lung cancer. No, God didn't give you lung cancer. You were smoking so much, affected your health. So don't blame God. Of course, we can go to God and say, God, I, I'm so sorry, I, I mess, messed up, please heal me. That is a different thing, but we don't blame God. It's what you have sown, you are reaping. No. The thing is, this is where mercy comes. What is mercy? In God's mercy, he prevents us from reaping the full extent of what we have sown. That is mercy. If we all reap the full extent of what we have sown, we'll all be in big trouble. But God in his mercy, he minimizes the, the effect of what we have sown. That is mercy. Grace is what we have not sown, he gives us. The good he gives us. Freely. God didn't say, huh, you, you earned it. No. Without earning it, I'm giving you. That is grace. Mercy is what you deserve. I'm reducing the punishment. That is mercy. Right? So thank God for mercy and grace. Right? Both are important. But we should understand that uh, sometimes the suffering that people go through are their own actions. We can't blame God. So in those situations, what do we do? We have to tell people to take responsibility. You know. Uh, take responsibility for your actions and then uh, 
you know, get wisdom, get the help of God to correct yourself, to do what is you know, do what is right, right? instead of blaming God and learn from the mistakes. Um, you can learn from it and benefit from your mistakes, and uh, with God's help, uh, He will help us resolve or fix those mistakes. Right? And uh, so that's what. Third reason there is suffering is because of satanic pressure. So devil causes trouble. We see examples in Job. Um, the Bible tells us very clearly, Satan went and troubled Job. Satan went and troubled Job. So for everything we read happening in chapter 1, 2, and 3, it's the devil doing it, you know, his family, his life, livestock, animals, property, finally his own health, his own body. Satan did it. God didn't do it. Now somebody say, hey, but, but God, God gave permission. That is true. Even today, Satan is operating on the earth. Demons are operating on the earth. And God knows about it. It's not like God has gone to sleep and, oh, I, he doesn't know. You know, so in one sense, Yes, God has permitted the devil and his demons to operate on the earth today, same way. But just because God has permitted it, he's not responsible for it. Example. Do we have police officers in Bangalore? Yes, we have sub-inspector, inspector, everybody, chief minister, governor, everybody there in the city of Bangalore. Does crime happen? Accidents happen, crime happens, traffic violates, all kinds of things. Do we blame Chief Minister? Chief Minister, because of you, that happened. Because of you, the, the, you know, do those officials want these crimes to happen? No. They are there to prevent the crimes. Do crimes happen? Yes. Do we blame them directly for every crime? No. Who's doing it? It's the people who are doing it, the, 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 you know, the violators, they're doing it. But they are there to come in and intervene or to uh, deal with the situation. And they you know, report the crime and they will take action. Or in some cases, they will prevent. So uh, that, that's just an illustration saying that, see, God is sovereign. God is powerful. He does not want it to happen. But because he has given authority to man, we have man has handed this world over to Satan. Satan is operating. Right? And he's causing all this. So we don't blame God for it. The person who's responsible is the devil. Because the devil did it. That sickness was from the devil. That, that, that trouble was from the devil. We recognize that is the devil at work. So we hold the devil responsible. And as believers, we must know that we are in a better position than Job. Why? First of all, Job did not have the revelation you and I have. He didn't know. Right? Job said, the Lord has given, the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Job, no, no, no. God didn't take away. God didn't take away. But he didn't know better. He didn't have the Bible. He didn't know the truth. He didn't have insight into the spiritual realm that actually it was the devil who was coming and causing all these problems. So he said, you know, God has given, God has taken. No, no, God didn't take away. God gave you, devil has taken away. But Job did not have the understanding. He did not have the revelation. Right? So God in his God was good to Job because oh, we read 40, 42 chapters in the book of Job, but it is only it was describing one year of his life. Now we read 42 chapters because they all spoke so much. But it is one year of his life. At the end of the year, it says God began that process of restoration. And God restored to Job twice as much as he had. So we, we must understand that today we are in a better position than Job because we have the Bible, the cross has happened, 
God has given us weapons of our warfare. So we can stand up and we can fight against the devil. Job did not have any of that. Did in our Bible? He didn't have the cross of Jesus. He didn't have any weapons. He didn't know about faith. He didn't know about the blood of Jesus. He didn't know about the armor of God. None of those things. Right? So today, as believers, we are in a better position to resist the devil than Job. Same devil coming to do the same kinds of things. But we can stand, given the weapons that God has given to us. So no, nobody should say, I am God's Job. Why are you, why God, why this, why are you trying to be God's Job? God doesn't want you to be his Job. He's given you his weapons. He's given you his word. He said, take, put on the web armor of God and stand against all the wiles of the devil. Right? So, It's the devil who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And we should resist. We should fight against these things. We don't tolerate these things. Even if he keeps coming back, we stand. Because God has given us so much as believers. Right? But at the same time, we, we see here in Paul's case, in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 1 through 10, Paul is saying, you know, he is describing his own spiritual journey, how God had given him so much of revelation. And he says, there was a messenger of Satan that was sent against Paul, Paul uh, that came against Paul. And uh, he, he prayed, 2 Corinthians uh, 12. Yeah, 2 Corinthians 12. We'll just read uh, verses. 7 to 10. Second Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. Uh, I'd like us to look at it and understand it carefully. Second Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. Paul says, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather glory, rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now. A lot of believers read this passage. Now, on one hand, there's a lot of encouragement we can draw, right? And we will draw encouragement from it. But a lot of believers read this passage about Paul's thorn, and they make some wrong deductions, and we want to address that. Sometimes believers say, oh, I have a thorn in the flesh. They say, my sickness is a thorn in the flesh, or whatever, some problem that's thorn in the flesh. First of all, why do you want a thorn in the flesh? Are you? Secondly, are you as great as Apostle Paul that you qualify? You know, why was a thorn in the flesh permitted for Paul? He gives a reason. Verse 7, he says, Lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations. So Paul is saying, I received so much revelation. In fact, in the previous, earlier verses, he talks about he was caught up to heaven. He couldn't, he doesn't know whether in the flesh or not, whether in the body or not in the body. And he heard and saw things that he can't even tell us. So I was taken to heaven. And God had given him so much revelation. So because of all that revelation, and lest he should become proud, lest I should be exalted above measure, God said, Paul, I am allowing this to happen. 
So when somebody says, I have a thorn in the flesh like the Apostle Paul, he says, did you receive so much revelation like the Apostle Paul? Right? There was a reason why this, this was happening. Right? Because Paul had received so much revelation. God said, Paul, I'm going to let this happen in your life. Right? This is going to happen. This, and this thorn in the flesh. Now, what was this thorn in the flesh? It was not some sickness. It was not some disease. What was it? It says that, verse 7, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. A messenger of Satan. That is, uh, an, an, an angel, a, a de demonic being. So it's not a sickness or thing. It's a demonic being that would come, buffet me, keep coming again and again against Paul. Over and over again. So it almost like wherever Paul went, he realized that there was this demonic power trying to oppose him, hinder him, cause trouble. And in chapter 11, he described all his troubles. He was shipwrecked so many times. He was beaten so many times. He, you know, he had to face so much hardship. So there was this messenger of Satan trying to stop Paul. Paul realized it and he prayed three times. Lord. I can see this devil is doing these things. Yeah. Take him out. And Paul, God's response is, Paul, my grace. So I'm sure in that conversation, God would have revealed why this is happening. Paul, this is happening because I just want you to stay humble. I want you to make sure that you are staying humble. Right? And so that's why he writes it, lest I should be exalted above measure. So God gave him the understanding why this thing is happening. This is helping you, helping keep you humble. But Paul, I want you to know, in all of this, my grace is more than enough for you. So yes, in, you're going to face this messenger of Satan, this demonic power, keep coming against you over and over again. It's helping you in one way, Paul, it's keeping you, keeping your feet on the ground. And, but at the same time, my grace is more than enough for you. That means this messenger of Satan will not prevent you from fulfilling my call on your life. You will get the job done. My grace is sufficient for you. And so that's why he says, my strength is made perfect. That means my strength comes to the fullness and I feel weak. I'm really strong. So he's not saying, I have no strength. Oh, God help. Me. No, 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 no. So God, I know the devil is coming. He's doing all this. But I feel weak. I feel so much trouble. But my strength comes to perfection. So it's not like he's without strength. He's full of strength. Because of the grace of God empowering him. But there's a reason why God, in this particular case, didn't cause this particular demon to flee. Bible says, resist the devil, he will flee from you. And this particular case, God is coming back, coming back, coming back. Why he is coming back? God said, Paul, he'll help you stay humble, but it will not stop you. My grace is enough for you. Your strength will be at its full measure. You keep going. Right. So when Paul is finishing his course, he said, I have fought the good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. In other words, hey, this messenger of Satan kept coming but didn't succeed. I finished my course. Because if Paul had not finished his course, then the devil would have won the one prevail. Right? So the point we're making here is that this is a special situation in Paul's life. You know, it is not for everyone. The normal is you resist the devil and he will. The normal is you put on the full armor of God and you will be able to stand against all the wiles of the wicked. That's for every believer. But in Paul's case, because of the abundance of revelations that God given him, Paul, God had to say, Paul, you have to keep fighting. This, this demon will keep coming back. But one purpose is serving is your feet will stay on the ground. But on the other side, my strength is made perfect. My grace is enough for you. Your strength will always be full. You keep going. Right? So, um, uh, you know, so we know that uh, the devil is there uh, doing uh, evil works, but we should not think or we should not 
accept the devil's work as, oh, this is my thought. I have to live with it the rest of my life, like the Apostle Paul. No, Apostle Paul's case, very special case because of the revelation he had. For us as believers, the God of peace will crush Satan underneath our feet. We expect victory. We expect to overcome. Okay. So um, we need to understand that uh, the, third re uh, the third reason here is uh, that there is an enemy that does wicked things, but God has empowered us, anointed us to go and bring deliverance to people. Okay? So that's how we should face the works of darkness. When we see the works of darkness, we do what Jesus in Acts 10, 38, Luke 13, 10, 13, where we set people free from the works of the devil. Right? God has anointed us so that we can uh, uh, overcome uh, and destroy the works of the devil. And also keep in mind, you know, how does Satan trouble us, right? He oppresses people through circumstances, situations. And he also delays things. So not all delays, like we heard on Sunday, uh, not all delays are from God. You know, sometimes the delay is because the devil is hindering. Now, a classic example is that of Daniel. Daniel is praying. When D1 days, no answer. Or what happened? And finally, Angel Gabriel comes. Daniel, from the first day you started praying, your prayer was heard. And God sent me. But there was a war in the heavenlies. Right? So Gabriel was coming with the message. Answered. He was sent on the very first day. But in the heavenlies, the prince of Persia. So Daniel was in Persia. There were the spiritual principalities above this area. And he was helped by the prince of Greece. And they was, you know, hindering Gabriel from reaching. And then Michael came on the other side. And together broke through and brought the answer to Daniel. But Daniel, in those 21 days, just continued in prayer. He didn't give up. So this delay was not caused by God. It was there was a war. Satan was trying to hinder. So we see that uh, sometimes answers to prayer or other things may be delayed because the devil is interfering, trying to put hindrance. But we must just be strong in faith and say, "No, devil, I'm not. You know, I'm not going to let you win. I will get my answer from God." Yeah? So that's another way uh, the enemy works. Other things he causes, failure, all kinds of things, sickness, disease. So what must we do, right? As we minister to people or as we journey through life, we need to discern what is the devil doing. If we exercise our God-given authority to resist and overcome Satan's working, we stand firm, we don't quit. And we should don't blame God for what the devil does. And uh, we stand up against the enemy and uh, resist the enemy. Right? So I put this statement in underlined form. Nothing happens when we keep waiting for God to do what he has instructed us to do. You're waiting for God. God, please do it. And God's saying, hello, hello. I'm waiting for you to do it, you know. You do it. Where is it God? I'm waiting for you. God is saying, I'm waiting for you. You. You step out. You stretch out. Yeah. You do it. Okay. So we need to understand you know, where the responsibility is and uh, step into it. Okay. So when the enemy is attacking, you know, don't we shouldn't magnify the devil. Oh, the devil is troubling me. Devil, hey, no, 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 he's such a, just don't pay attention. No, uh, you, you fight, fight your battle, but don't make the devil so important. Overcome. You know, he's causing problems, but you overcome. Okay, let's just finish the others. Number four, 
suffering due to other people's actions. So there is suffering in this world because other people are doing bad things and we can't control their actions. So other people do evil things. Now think about Joseph uh, in the Old Testament. His own brothers did harm to him. His own brother sold him, sent him as a slave to Egypt. Of course, that was must have been a very hard time. Emotionally, physically, very difficult time. And Joseph was saying, God, where are you? Why are you letting this happen? But who did it? His brothers. Why? They were jealous. So jealousy, they did. But through it all, God was working out his plan. Okay, God said, Joseph, I'll get you out of this. There's something I'm going to bring out of this. Okay? But that going through that journey, those that I think like 13 years, uh, was not easy. Must have been very humiliating. And then after he goes there to Egypt, Potiphar's wife wrongly accuses him. Then he puts him in jail. He said, God, at least I had a decent job. Now job also gone. I'm in jail. Whose fault? Not his fault. Other people's actions are putting him into a lot of trouble. But God brings him out of all of that. Right? So sometimes we face trouble because other people are doing all kinds of things. They're people. And God is not uh, controlling their actions. They're doing it. But then God brings us out. And it brings us out of those things. Okay? So there is persecution. There are other act, people's actions that may cause us problems that... Uh, you know, and, and Peter, in his epistle, in First Peter, he identifies many reasons, uh, situations, and this is on page 89, where believers face trouble. You know? He says, uh, believers suffer wrongfully in the workplace. They're not treated fairly. Uh, believers suffer for doing good. They are persecuted or falsely accused. They are suffering against sin, not wanting to do what is wrong. They are suffering as a Christian. Because you bear the name of Jesus, people, you know, uh, it mistreat you. Sometimes, uh, of course, believers do wrong things. They suffer for their own actions. And they are suffering due to the adversary, the devil. So there are several reasons why people... Uh, believers were facing all these things. But Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 18 to 23, he says, you know, if you suffer wrongfully, that means when people falsely accuse you or are unfair to you because you bear the name of Jesus, because you're doing what is right, he says, you know, it's commendable uh, because you're having a good conscience before God. You endure that because you're called to follow the example of Jesus. Who, when Jesus was falsely accused, he did not fight back. Just follow Jesus. And the spirit of glory and of Christ rests upon you. Right? So there are, there are all of these reasons where we suffer because of what other people do to us. And at the same time, you know, we should not become, I'm, I'm, I'm on page 90. Uh, we don't become persecution minded. That means, oh, people are persecuting me. People come to harm to me. Don't be persecution minded, but be protection minded. That is, God will protect me. You know? Let people do what they want. Let people say what they want. God will protect me. Right? So don't be so preoccupied with the persecution or with the wrong that people will do. That is their problem. But I know God will protect me. God will keep me. And uh, God will, you know, uh, bring me through these things. So uh, we should focus on the fact that God is protecting us. Right? Don't focus on the persecution. It'll come, it'll come and go. People will do all kinds of things. Uh, and instead, we pray for those who are persecuting us. That's what Jesus taught us. Right? Number five is that 
sometimes people suffer because of divine discipline and divine judgment. So these are two different things. Discipline is different from judgment. Discipline is God's loving correction to make us better. Judgment is God judging us because we are somebody's way off. They've gone beyond the extent of his mercy and grace. So different things. For a believer, normally a believer receives divine discipline. You know, that is in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 17. Where, uh, the writer of Hebrews, he says, you know, as a father lovingly corrects his children, God also disciplines us. You know, now the discipline from God, he uses the old word chastening. Now the discipline that comes from God, it doesn't seem good. I mean, it doesn't feel good. But he is doing it for our own right, for our own benefit, you know, to train us in righteousness, the di divine discipline. So God is not judging the believer in that sense. He is giving us discipline. How does God discipline us? Through his word, he corrects us. Through the prompting of his spirit, through other godly people in our lives, they'll come and speak to us. And so God disciplines us through that. And we must receive his discipline. And simply just say yes to his discipline, correct yourself, and keep going. Right? So that's discipline. But sometimes the discipline of God also may not be easy for us. Because God says, okay, I need you to stop doing that. I need you to change the way how you're speaking. I need you to be more kind. I need you to be more humble. Okay, God. Yes, okay, okay. And we have to change ourselves. It may not be easy. It may be a little suffering there, but that's a good suffering because it is training us in righteousness. Okay? So that kind of suffering, we should not avoid. We say, God, I want, I want you to discipline me so I can become better. But on the other hand, uh, there is God's judgment. That means when, 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 when somebody has gone beyond the extent of God's grace and judgment, uh, mercy, then he says, okay, I have to judge this person. That means God is seriously dealing with the sin in that person's life. First of all, as a believer, we normally don't go into that position. Why? Because if we are walking with God, day to day we are trying to stay aligned to God. Yeah, we may make small mistakes. God disciplines us, corrects us lovingly through his word, through prayer, through being in his presence. Correct? We correct ourselves, we keep going. So we're not coming under God's judgment. But if a person, believer or non-believer, goes beyond the extent of God's grace, so he'll give us long grace and mercy. Okay, you're going, 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 going. Then it's okay, now it's after judge. So we see God judging where he intervenes in our life in a very serious way to get us back. Right? But that is only for a believer who, or a person who's going on and on in sin. So as believers day to day, uh, we don't need to. So for example, we see ex examples in the Bible. Think about Ananias and Sapphira. Right? In that case, they were in a place of great glory. Right? Uh, the presence of God was so much. So wherever there is great glory, there is also low tolerance for sin. Wherever the presence of God is great, there's a low tolerance for sin. And so their sin was judged very seriously. There's a young man in Corinth who was committing sexual immorality and Paul said we had to judge him. Uh, there are the two Hymenes and Alexander was causing trouble in the church in Ephesus and Paul said we have to judge them. Right? So there is there's a place for divine judgment, but typically believers don't go there. Right? They, are, they receive divine discipline. Let me pause here. I think somebody would have asked a question here. Okay. Uh, Pastor, I have a question. Yeah. Go uh, if there's a delay in justice, then uh, who's, uh, who's involved? I mean, who is it from God or is it from Satan? If uh, delaying justice in the court cases. Ah, so that 
is not from God, right? Because, okay, what is the nature of God? God's nature is that he's a just God. Yeah. yeah. So he will not withhold justice, neither is he going to delay justice. He's not going to be unfair to us. So then we'll have to think, okay, it's probably the human people who are doing it or the devil causing that, working through people and working through situations, causing that. So that's where we need to press through. We need to fight both in the natural and the spiritual. The natural means, you know, we make the necessary appeals and whatever paperwork, those things, we do that. But in the spiritual, we fight and deal with every hindering force that is obstructing the grant of justice for, for the person. Yes, Pastor. Thank you so much. All right. There's another question here. Uh, from Pastor, I just wanted to check, like, you know, in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3, it says, do not uh, uh, tarry, like, for the vision uh, will come uh, at an appointed time. So when you're waiting on the Lord for an answer, so how do we discern this uh, delays uh, either from the Satan or is it like from God? And yeah, I think that's one question. And the second follow-up for the same thing is like uh, uh, when it comes to a vision time, even if uh, we flip up or we mess around with things, will it still happen in the time that God has a uh, thing? Or for our actions, uh, the answers get a little bit delayed. Mm, okay. Yeah. So... Uh, yeah, I understood your question. So when God gives a vision, which is something that he wants us to do, uh, a vision has its timing in our lives, right? So God has a plan. And usually when God will, when he's speaking to an individual, he'll speak well in advance so that he can prepare us for that vision. So that's the reason God speaks ahead of time, right? So that's Habakkuk 2 and 3 and 4. And whether it's a, so when God speaks to an individual, he speaks with reference to a lifetime. When God speaks to a community, he speaks in terms of generations. That means, you know, it could happen in this generation, it could happen in, in, in the next generation. So when he speaks to the church or when he speaks to the nation of Israel, he speaks in terms of millennial, millennium. That means in terms of thousands of years. So we should understand the time frame that God uses depending on who he's speaking to, right? He's speaking to an individual, is that the time frame is in your lifetime. And he's speaking to a community in generations. Speaking to the church, it's millennium in thousands of years, right? So example, Jesus said, you know, in Revelation, he said, behold, I come quickly. It's almost 2,000 years. But hey, he's speaking to the church. So the time frame is thousands of years, right? So coming back to your question, when God speaks to an individual and is giving them a vision for their life, a certain assignment for their life, it's with reference to their lifetime. And so it's up to that individual to discern when in their lifetime God wants that particular thing to happen. And usually God speaks ahead of time so that we could prepare for it and you know get ourselves ready for it. That's why he speaks to us. And so uh, that that is God's timing. So there is, as far as God's timing, there is no delay from his side, right? Because he's always on time. There's no delay from his side. Now, the kairos, kairos, so in the Greek, the word is kairos, the fullness of time. The kairos not only depends on God's time, but also on how we get ourselves ready. If I don't get myself ready for it, then I am going to delay the kairos. So God says, okay, you know, uh, exam, let's say example, God wanted to do something when I was age 30. He spoke to me, let's say, example, he spoke to me when I was 18 and said, okay, you know, and God's, let's say God's Kairos time was age 30. But if I was just goofing around, not bothered about it, not preparing myself for it, age 30 will come and go. God is ready, but he cannot release it. Why? Because I have not been ready. Right? And I need to get myself ready, get myself ready. So the Kairos is also dependent on the person through whom he wants to release the vision. And sometimes the person also messes up, meaning uh, they may do things that are actually wrong. They go off in the wrong direction. That further delays. But the plan of God and the purpose of God for the individual will never be changed. 
Okay? Romans, Romans 11 verse 29. The, call, the gifts and the calling of God are unchangeable. Right? So God doesn't change his mind about the gifting and the calling on a person's life. He doesn't change it. Just that, you know, he has to get the person to come into agreement and prepare themselves and move in step with him. Yeah. Perfect, Pastor. Okay. Thank you. All right. The question, another question in the chat. I've heard people saying he gives and takes away when people die. Is this statement right? Uh, it is not right because, um, you know, God has revealed his will in his word. God's word is truth. And in his word, he has said very clearly, example, Psalm 91, 14, with long life, I will satisfy you and show you my salvation. Exodus 23, 25. The number of your days I will fulfill. Right? Um, uh, First Peter 3. He who would love life and see good days, long days. You know, let him keep his tongue from evil and speak, uh, refrain his tongue from speaking evil. So there is this provision for a long life, which is the full length of our days. So that is the will of God. He's revealed it to us. He, Job chapter 5 says, you'll come to your grave in a full age, like a sheaf of corn that falls down to the ground. That means you come to the grave in a, in a time of full age, maturity. That's the will of God. But we know people die early, prematurely, and for various reasons. And we cannot say that that is God taking away their life. Why? Because... There's a lot of human side to it. If a person is reckless and does harm to themselves and they die early, is it God's fault? No. It was that person's individual's thing, right? So uh, we should not say God took them away. I mean, if they're a believer and they're with Jesus, we're grateful, always grateful that they are saved and they're with the Lord. But in terms of the length of life, we should understand the will of God. That it has revealed to us in scripture. Yeah. Yes, sister. Yes, brother. Thank you. Okay. All right. I'll just pause here. There's a lot of noise here. Um, okay. Uh, there's one last question here. Uh, uh, Sam asks a bit unrelated. When a person passes away, people say, rest in peace. Is that biblical? Well, uh, there is no. Biblical term as such, and there's no scripture in, in that sense. Um, but I think it just, uh, you know, it's just uh, what is it, a practice people make. But it's not, I would say, it's not biblical you know, because really they they they're not resting there, if, especially a believer. That believer is enjoying the presence of God. He's probably dancing in joy with joy, not resting in peace. He's in God's glorious presence. So the term really has no biblical context or meaning, but I think it's just a nice thing for people to say, or you know, but it is not real, it's not true. Because truly a believer is in the presence of Jesus and just celebrating the goodness of God. Okay, so let's pause here. We'll continue this tomorrow and uh, we will finish this and move on to other things. Okay. Um, see you all tomorrow. Thank you.